Welcome to Face to Face. This is a show about change and about what's next. It's a show that wants to ask questions, peel back the layers of our average everyday experience and go beyond scratching the surface. We interview amazing people with incredible ideas and stories who have done wild, weird and wonderful things. Remember that imagination shared create collaboration and collaboration creates community and community inspires social change. I'm David Peck and this is Face to Face. Welcome again to Face to Face, and uh, today's uh, guest we have with us is uh, David Wojcik. He's the uh, uh, president and executive producer of uh, Biz TV Canada. Uh, we were just chatting briefly before we started the, the digital recorder, and he tells me he's a guy who has at least four date books. So, uh, uh, four four date timers, I'm going to say. So, so we we'll, we'll get back to that. But uh, thanks for joining us today, David. My pleasure, David. Always uh, always great to talk to you. Yeah, it's uh, it's it's uh, it's been interesting. Interesting and fun getting to know you. So, so, uh, David, can you tell us a little bit about Biz TV Canada? And that's uh, B I Z uh, or Z, depending on where you're from. T V Canada. Uh, check it out. There's uh, a lot of interesting stuff going on there. But can you tell us a little bit more about the website and your business and, and what it is you do? Yeah, Biz TV Canada was uh, a brainchild of mine that started about five years ago. Uh, I had always loved. Uh, educating people, and I love business, and I love entrepreneurship, so I wanted to develop uh, a program that was a celebration of entrepreneurship and and uh, talked about the great things, the good things about business and the good things about uh, about wonderful people that have just done great things and become wonderful successes in their own business. So I developed the original concept for uh, Rogers TV for uh, a program that I still do, hmm. which is called In Business. Oh. Uh, we're coming up to show number 200. I've oh, wow. interviewed uh, just about 1,000 people on, on that wow. particular show. Um, and, when, and when is that on? Uh, that one airs in the Peel region. That's Mississauga, Brampton, and Caledon. Uh, we are live on Monday nights at eight o'clock. And that's Ontario for our American and global listeners. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Uh, and and that particular show, it is a it's a regional show. And my my dream was always to have something on a, a network television, uh, a network uh, uh, show. So we started down that path and. Mm-hmm. And uh, built uh, built the content, built the website, and in uh, November of 2011, we launched Biz TV Canada as an all internet uh, television show. So we put up a a different video every day, Monday to Friday. Uh, we interview uh, entrepreneurs that have been a success in their business. Uh, we interview. Uh, people that are talking about cutting edge uh, things. We just did a session with uh, Cindy Gordon from Invest Canada. She's talking about crowdfunding coming into Canada. It's very popular in the UK, very popular in the US, but uh, so far uh, Canadians have uh, struggled with it. Crowd crowdfunding would that be like something like a Kickstarter? Um, yeah, exactly, exactly. That's exactly what it is. So it's a, it's a really unique and interesting way to fund, say, your documentary film that you're going to make, or a documentary film, or your small business. Right. Uh, it's uh, uh, so Cindy and her group uh, have done a, a number of things. So we did an interview uh, on that particular item. We have a lot of guru gabs, of which you have been a part of. And, yes, thank you and, for that. Uh, actually, one of our most popular gurus. Oh, isn't that wonderful? Present. One of your because of your presentation style, people gravitate to that. A friend of mine thinks it's utterly ridiculous that that I'm referred to as a guru. Just so you know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, you, you see, should. he doesn't know you. Like he that. he found it, I think, on a link through Toronto Star, and you should see yeah. the email I got from him. Yeah. I think it was kind of if there had been you know tone, attitude, and sarcasm that he could have added digitally, he would have. <laughs> you know. 
<laughs> so, uh, well, speaking of that, uh, that's one of uh, one of the uh, platforms that we get our videos out to. So, through yeah. our own website at uh, biztvcanada.com, dot com, um, we we archive all of our videos there. We have, I think, there's somewhere around three to three hundred and fifty business videos that are up there on various topics, wow, from HR, to law, to marketing, to lots on social media. And uh, uh, we stream daily on uh, the Financial Post Entrepreneur Online. Uh, the uh, star, which uh, your friend saw you on, yep. uh, the star licenses 20 of our videos a month. Uh, we fly with Air Canada on their in-flight entertainment. Wow, wow you guys get around. Yeah, and um, and on April the 6th, of this year, 2013, we launch on the CHCH television network, which is a must-carry channel on all cable carriers in Ontario and satellite carriers across Canada. Wow. Wow, that's great. Well, it sounds like an incredible resource for, for a lot of reasons, and the stuff that I've seen on there is certainly quite mm-hmm. quite interesting for, for a variety of, uh, for, I think, for a variety of different people as well. It's not just for business folk. It, exactly. It's it's also good for uh, for managers of yep. uh, mid to uh, large size companies. Oh, good. And, and a lot of the stuff that we put on there, uh, David, is because entrepreneurship is a lonely place hmm, okay. and and a lot of under, a lot of entrepreneurs and business owners that either don't have a staff or some of them that do have a staff they feel for some reason that they need to know everything right. that they, they when they put on the hr hat they should know all about the right, hr right. issues they should know all about marketing they should know about sales and the fact is you can't know everything. Yeah, well, that's just not true, right? It's not true. Yeah. So we give them this safe place to to come to the website, yep. and they can search by topic, they can search by subject, uh, a number of different ways to search uh, all the videos that we have. So in the safety of their own home or their own office with earplugs in, yep. <laughs> yep. Yep. they can get this incredible array of, uh, of advice uh, at in the when they want it, twenty four seven, any time they like. So, so that's so. Let's talk a little bit about that notion of entrepreneurship, the loneliness factor. I, I noticed on your LinkedIn page, you are um, endorsed for the most uh, the most endorsements you've received are as an entrepreneur. Um, I mean, ha- happy to hear you tell me your own entrepreneurial story, but why why is it so lonely out there as, as an <laughs> entrepreneur? I mean, I know that means it's this individual that's incredibly driven and passionate and committed and so on but what is what is it about entrepreneurship that's uh, that's so uh, problematic or, or maybe not problematic but certainly lonely as you say i think that people that endorse me are very kind to uh, <laughs> to be uh, so uh, so wonderful to uh, to click that button to endorse me for entrepreneurship uh, i i i beat that entrepreneur drum every place i go and uh, and I encourage people that have chosen that path. Um, why it's so lonely is uh, and and I uh, I I did an interview with Ron Foxcroft, who invented the Fox Forty whistle, which is used in every professional sport in the world now. He also is the CEO of Fluke Transport, which is, which is a uh, uh, a big carrier here in uh, Ontario and across Canada. And and he told the story of how lonely it is. And and when you when you're trying to make a decision, you don't want to turn to your staff because you don't want to you don't want them to feel like you don't know because you're supposed to know. And you can't turn to your spouse. Because you scare the crap out of them, right? Right. <laughs> Especially if it's a financial thing. If, right. If there's right. if there's a financial precipice coming, you don't want to scare them. So where do you turn to? Who do you talk to? Um, you know, surprisingly, although we're surrounded by other entrepreneurs, we tend not to seek out their counsel to just sit and talk about. The uh, the issues of the day, like what's going on in 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 your business life, and and uh, you know for the most part, entrepreneurs are are very positive individuals, mm-hmm. so they want to they don't want to appear that you're you know they're crying in their beer all the time, mm-hmm. 
But sometimes you just need a sounding board. You yeah. need someone to bitch and complain to yeah. uh, because of something that's happened. And it's not that you're down on anything. It's just you need a place to vent. Yeah, yeah, of course. And of you course. can't vent to your to your staff. You can't vent with your with your spouse. Uh, you can't vent with your customers. You don't want to vent with your vendors. Yeah. So where do you go? And that's why it becomes very lonely. Um. What do you think? So, you know, there's a, I think there's an interesting mix of, of folks that I've met that I would call entrepreneurs uh, with respect to, you know, their thinking and their, their level of creativity, their ability to focus, their, their uh, you know, their, maybe their OCD as well as their ADD. Um, but what makes a great entrepreneur? It's a question that I've asked in every interview that I've ever done. With uh, uh, with some of the people that have really been successful in their business, and the answer, although it uh, the the verbiage changes yeah. a little bit, the sentiment is the same. It's it's someone that has an unwavering desire to achieve a goal, and no matter what happens they will continue down that path. Mm. Now, some entrepreneurs have said they will continue down the path and go right over the cliff. Right, right. <laughs> which which is sometimes which is not good. Although sometimes you know going over that cliff uh, can be very a very valuable lesson. Uh, right, right. As one uh, wise person said to me, you know, experience may not be the best teacher, but it certainly is the most effective. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And uh, when you find an entrepreneur that's failed, uh, two or three times, and, and, and I use the word failed in a positive way yep. mm-hmm. because they learn something from that experience, and they will take that experience and they will apply it to the next one. Now, if, if they fail twice on the same thing, then maybe they have a problem. Yeah, right, but, right. But for the most part, uh, they, just have this, they just have this tremendous, tremendous focus on getting something done. It sounds to me like there's a wisdom there, though, as well, because uh, uh, you you don't want to go over the cliff, right? It's certainly not the goal. (laughs) Right, right. Certainly not the goal. So the desires there, the passions there, the focus is there to get to this end goal, to get to this objective, whatever the heck that is. But we've still got to be careful that, I mean, didn't somebody say that, um, um, uh, somebody really successful, and I don't remember who it was, you know, rule number one is never lose money, and rule number two is never forget rule number one, right? <laughs> so, I mean, to me, going over the cliff would be, you know, losing your shirt. Yes. You and, know, in and more ways on, than one. Many entrepreneurs have done that. And many entrepreneurs have done that, yeah. Many have, uh, have gone bankrupt. Uh, Walt Disney went bankrupt uh, huh. two or three times. Is that right, eh? Before he finally uh, made it. Um, a, a number of, the, of, of great entrepreneurs have, have either gone bankrupt or have been on the precipice right. of, of right. losing everything. Robert Hershevik huh. talks, uh, yep. talks about his, uh, his story where after he sold his first business, his, he almost lost his second business, and it wasn't because he didn't have enough money. It was because he had too much. And he said, here we were with all this money, and we could do anything we wanted. And we tried to do anything and everything we wanted, and we lacked focus, hmm. and we almost lost the business. Interesting. Okay. And so he said, sometimes not having a great deal of money is a good thing right. because it – it hones in that laser-like focus, that laser beam focus on your goal, right. and you and you uh, you don't do all the stuff that takes you away, takes your focus away. So, so I've heard a crazy stat, and I think it's um, I don't know if it's Canadian or if it's American, but eighty percent of all startups fail. Um, the, the statistic is it, it varies. Um, it's 80% of, uh, all startups fail within the first five years. Okay. And, uh, and then 90% will fail within the first 10 years. So it's about a 10% wow. uh, survival rate. And, and I've heard, I, and I should have done the research on this, uh, but I think 400,000 fail every year in Canada alone. Um, so, I, I mean, I, on one level, that sounds really high to me. 
Yeah, it's, it, it might sound really high. Uh, I, I don't think the, like, the failure doesn't mean that there's out-and-out out bankruptcy. Okay, 400, okay, 000 okay. Businesses, that's helpful, yeah. Uh, a year. And, uh, and, and 400,000 uh, sounds a, a bit high just for the, for the Canadian market. That, that uh, might be more of a U.S. market uh, type of statistic. Right. But, but, I mean, a lot of people just give up. Right, uh, right. So it's not that they uh, they declare bankruptcy and they lose their house and and uh, and have to go down that path, um, but they just they just give up. Um, a lot of businesses where we find this is are the businesses where there's a low barrier to entry and a low barrier to to exit. Uh, we find people will in the service industry, uh, and I'll uh, I'll pick on my uh, my own profession uh, uh, finance where. People will, they lose their job or they quit their job as a, as an accountant. And they will open up a, a service for accounting services or bookkeeping services if they're not accredited. Right. And it's a very low barrier to, to entry. I mean, what do you need? We need a, a laptop and a piece of software. Right. Sure. And a cell phone, sure, and a yeah. couple of business cards, and you know we're off to uh, the we're right. off to the races. Yeah, yeah. Uh, especially around, especially at this time of year during tax season. Right. So you've got all kinds of people that are springing up, and uh, and and doing uh, uh, tax returns for for small businesses and and individuals, and and charging uh, very reasonable rates. So very low barrier to entry for that. And then when they get a job or a, an opportunity comes along that's better than what they're doing, because as we know, entrepreneurship and self-employment is, uh, uh, it's tough. <laughs> yes. Yeah, very much so. <laughs> to, to make it. Yeah. And, and they have an opportunity to come along and they are out of the game and they are back into, uh, into a salaried position. So that goes into the statistic of a business failure because it closed. Right. Now, right. why did it close? You know, all, all different kinds all of All kinds things. of questions, yeah. 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 Um, uh, I don't know the last time we chatted if, if we talked about Michael Gerber and the E-Myth. Yes, yes, I, yes. I, I, I think we did. All he, three, I have all three of them. Oh, okay. So I've read one. It was given to me by a friend of mine who I want to talk about a little bit later. But but he talks, I think, and, and it sounded to me a little bit like uh, what you were just chatting about this, you know, uh, the, the distinction between um, building a business and actually creating a job for yourself. Yeah. <laughs> and, and, and can you talk about that? Like, I mean, I think if I remember correctly, he said, if you just create a job for yourself as an entrepreneur, you're going to fail. <laughs> but if you create a business... And that can operate without you, and that's going to have to include process, and it's have to going to include, you know, certain uh, other uh, uh, systems that are put in place that are uh, that are actually good. You know, it's kind of the hit by the bus theory, right? If I was to get hit by a bus, is my business going to survive without me or not? It, can, right. Can you talk a little bit more about that distinction? Uh, well, first of all, I think uh, Gerber did an, an amazing job. Uh, with writing three books about the same topic, and I right. think we discussed that as well. Yes, there's the E Myth, the E Myth Revisited, and the uh, the E Myth Manager. <laughs> yes, yes, and it's the same concept written three different ways. So kudos to uh, <laughs> the Gerber for right. for uh, recycling the same idea in three different ways and making some money at it. Um, uh, the, the one thing that I do disagree with him on is that not everybody wants to be this grandiose entrepreneur that, that, that uh, builds an empire. Right. Some people are, they want to make a living. They, they're, they're okay with it. There's a lot of, uh, uh, you know, I'll go down the, the trades. There's a lot of plumbers and electricians and, uh, and tradespeople that make a very nice living, and they are on their own. They right. don't right. want the pain in the butt of having uh, staff and right. employees. Right. They don't want to deal with all of the agencies that you have to deal with when you have employees. And they're quite happy. They make a wonderful living. And they, uh, they have this business that, that, uh, that goes along until they retire. Um, they, you know, do they have something to sell at the end? Uh, maybe. But chances are they don't. But that's okay because they've... They've uh, they've used it as a job. 
They right, just right. didn't need to answer to anyone. So I think that that is that's a fine thing to do as long as you treat it as a job and you know you you, you save for your retirement uh, because. There isn't going to be that massive company at the end. This this is like um, the van on the road that we see Bill's electrical work. Exactly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And this guy's probably very happy doing what he does and doesn't... Extremely happy. Yeah, (laughs) not not taking on more than he can handle, just, you know, staying alive and providing for his family and so on, not trying to build this, like, as you say, this empire. Yeah, and he he builds a nice business till he gets referrals and repeat customers because... So, you know that it happens in in those particular trades, and uh, and he gets to a point where he doesn't need to solicit any business anymore because the business just comes in and comes in and comes in, and when it gets to be too much, he refers it to uh, to Ralph's Electrical Service, which right. is his pal. Right. Right. Um, he takes weekends off. Um, he has a, a bookkeeper that takes care of the the accounting side of things. He goes on vacation. When he goes on vacation, he puts the you know he puts a message on saying, "Hey, I'll be back in a couple of weeks, and uh, and I'll see you then." And call call me then, yeah. And call me then, yeah. And <laughs> and if and if it's an emergency, call Ralph, my friend. <laughs> That's right, right, right. Um, but uh, what what Gerber's talking about is also a valid point is when you when you have someone that does want to build an empire and they do want to uh, stretch themselves into multiple locations if it's a retail uh, um, business or international if it's uh, if it's a business that would warrant that and and they they never bring their head up to take a uh, a view of what is happening out there mm-hmm. around them mm-hmm. and in the future. And to his term, which is, uh, it's a great term, it's been used over and over and over again to, to excess, but he, he calls it, you know, working on your business as opposed to working in your business. Right, right. And, and so that's where a number of people fail, is that they do the same <laughs> thing over and over and over again, and they expect a different result. Right. So... There's, need, there's, yeah, there's a cliche about that somewhere. Exactly, that's yeah. the the, um, <laughs> the, tr- the definition of insanity. That's right, yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. So uh, to, uh, to his point, uh, and he, he's, so he's taken that little bakery shop as an example, and he employs all of the things that you need to do in order to build that business into something that you want to expand. Now, the other part to that book is that he uh, uh, he talks about the uh, the little girl who uh, um, uh, you know take, opens up this uh, the bake shop and and gets recipes from uh, I think it's her auntie or her grandmother. Okay, yeah, um, uh, it's not ringing a bell for me. Start, yeah. start ringing a bell, and uh, and and she she opened the store because. She loves to bake. Right. Right. Yep. Right there is a problem. <laughs> because if you want to build an empire and you want to continue to, and, and you do, and you open that with the, uh, uh, because you love to bake, you know, you're, you're very, very quickly, you're going to end up hating to bake. Right. Because you, you can't do everything. And, you need to make a decision. Am I going to, am I going to run this business and grow it, or am I going to bake? Or what bake, am I going right, to do? Right, right. And then you make the choice. Either I bring someone in as a partner who can grow the business, and I can take care of the technical side of this business, and they'll take care of the growth of the business, and we'll make great partners, or I need to pay somebody to do the technical side of this, and I'll go on to grow the business. Do you think, David, that's part of the reason why so many um, artists fail? Like, they've got these great ideas, they're great painters, they're great singers, they're great writers, but they just can't seem to get the business side of things in place? Does that make sense? Absolutely. That's why, uh, I mean, we've got extremely talented and well-educated individuals that are terrible business people. Yeah. And, And that's not saying that they're bad. Yes. I mean, if someone asked me to to bake a cake, <laughs> yeah, yeah, I'm a I'm a 
I've got other skill sets. Baking a cake ain't one of them. Right. right. Uh, so we've got uh, dentists that are terrible business people. The doctors are probably the worst on the planet. Lawyers are not far be- behind right. them. Right. So we've got these, you know, very intelligent and uh, and talented individuals and musicians and artists and writers and sculptors, uh, photographers and videographers and you know the 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 list goes on and on. Extremely talented, very bright individuals, terrible business. Yeah, I remember. Uh, I, interestingly enough, when I worked with with the Royal Bank of Canada, not sort of uh, for them, uh, at 200 Bay in Toronto for about five years, I would take the GO train every day and uh, get off at the Toronto Union Station. And there was for the years it was there a poster, and I don't even remember what it was an ad for, which is troubling from a marketing perspective. But, <laughs> but. It had a quote, and it said, um, the only thing more expensive uh, than hiring a professional, and it was, you know, sort of posed as a, as a joke, is hiring an amateur. <laughs> and, and I think, I think having now run my own business for a couple of years, or at least still, you know, still at the four, four and a half year mark, still wondering what's next, is it going to work, um, you know, am I just too damn tired to keep going, um, you know, there's a time, and I think this is what Gerber's trying to get at, is that you, can, you can't do it all, like you've said, and you've got to bring in the pros. Bring in the people who know how to do the video. Bring in the people who know how to, don't be making your own website and, and doing your own design at one o'clock in the morning, <laughs> right? I mean, would you, would you agree with that? Or? Well, it's, it, it comes down to when we're starting out our business, we try to save a buck. Yeah, that's right. And we say, well... It's going to be good enough. <laughs> That's right. It's going to be good enough. Yes. The problem of good enough. Yeah. It'll true. be good enough. I just need something up there. I just need a website up there. So I'll, uh, I'll go <clears throat> my neighbor's, uh, my neighbor's daughter or son just graduated out of, uh, college and, uh, and they've got a design background and I know they took a couple of IT courses. That's right. So, so I'll get them to throw something up there, and it'll be good enough uh, to to get by. Um, I'm going to I'm going to design my own logo. I'm going to design my own flyer. Right. I'm going to design right. my own business card. It'll be good enough until I get going. The problem with that is that you are setting a culture and a brand right out of the gate. Mm. Mm -hmm. You're telling your customer, this is who I am and this is what my business is. And you're saying to your customer, I'm a good enough company. I'm not the best. (laughs) Right, right, right. And that can be extremely dangerous when you're... uh, when you're starting up, I, I talked to entrepreneurs, and, and I had the, the very good fortune to, to coach a number of them through a business enterprise center. And uh, one of the things we talk about is, so what hours are you going to set for your business? So, well, I'm self-employed, so um, you know, I don't really need to set hours. I'll just, I'll just work when, uh, when I need to. Right. Well, no, you can't just show up when you think you're going to show up. Right, you right. need to have set hours so your clients and your customers know when you're working and when you're not working. Otherwise, you are now going to be putting yourself at the beck and call of your customers. So they're going to call you at 8 o'clock at night, and you're going to respond. Right. You need to set your business hours so people understand, oh, this is a professional organization that I'm dealing with. They have set business hours. Not to say that you're not going to take care of clients in an emergency outside of uh, those business hours, but you set proper business hours. It goes to dress, how you're going to dress, uh, what your personal brand is going to look like, what your business brand is going to look like, all that kind of stuff. Invest a few extra dollars. Get some professionals to uh, to do that for you, and uh, and I will say that one of the one of the greatest logo designs that I ever had done for me was done by a uh, a college student. Now, uh, keeping in mind she was in her fourth year of her graphic design course, and and she uh, it just our worlds happened to collide at the same time, and I needed a logo for a restaurant and banquet hall uh, that I was opening up. And she needed a project 
for a uh, a final grade that she needed. Oh, okay. And so she said, "Listen, I'll design this thing at no cost if um, if if you'll let me use it in my portfolio for my final grade." Right. right. And uh, and we have some wickedly talented uh, individuals uh, in colleges. You just need to find them. You just need to find them. Well, this is the problem. There's so much talent out there, and and uh, it's. Uh, well, have you heard of Elance? I have not. Elance is really quite an interesting uh, thing. It's online. I don't know the website, but it's it's essentially, it's almost like a a um, what would it be like like. Um, Almost like an eBay, but for professional services. Mm. And so you go on and you say, I need transcribing done, or I need some uh, website uh, design done. You send out a note and you put some parameters around it. And within minutes, you start getting responses from entrepreneurs all over the world. And it's really quite wonderful. Um, you get you get your guy from Bangladesh at $4 an hour. You get yeah. your uh, young woman from Phnom Penh at, you know, $1.25 an hour. And you get your guy from uh, from Oklahoma at $17 an hour. And, yeah. and then you get to choose. And they've got their reports and they've got their quotes and their testimonials. And it's really pretty neat. And it's certainly a, a way of, uh, you know, especially for small businesses. I, I find, this is where I find technology so exciting. It's pretty amazing, actually. Yeah, when it, you know... David, when the internet works, it really is quite brilliant. <laughs> Would you not agree? And, and, and when it doesn't, it's a it's a curse. Oh, it's a disaster! It's, it's a, a curse that you just of, no, of, of, ex, of exponential. Oh, <laughs> it sure is. It sure is. Well, I think I agree with you. I think there's some really neat things about the about the technology and where it's heading to be celebrated. I mean, I know I work in development and work in the global south and just seeing, I mean, even, you know, a needs assessment in a community outside of Phnom Penh in Cambodia, you can do it on an iPod or an iPhone and you're asking questions of local people who have no, you know, access, et cetera, et cetera, extreme poverty. And as soon as you come back into your hotel, let's say you've got wireless there or you've, you know, you come into the center of town and they've got a, a, a point of presence of some kind, immediately... All that information is downloaded, it's put into a file, it's sent off to your head office in Toronto, and you've got a record in two different places and you can create reports. I mean, it's pretty amazing, you know, what's being done with cell phone technology as well. It's just, it, you know, in banking, it's remarkable. Well, there are, are so many businesses that are set up now here in uh, North America uh, utilizing the uh, the talents and services of uh, of a lot of uh, uh, incredibly talented individuals from uh, uh, from Asia, mm-hmm. uh, India, and China, yep. uh, who do really great work. And because it's all virtual, uh, it, it you know it you get a great price. Yes, and you also get a great product now. Sourcing them out's another again. Issue. We're, we're back to finding the right person, right? You got to find the yeah. you got to find the right person, and well, if that person is uh, halfway around the world, then you know, great. May take some experimenting, but it's like that with tradespeople as well. You know, recommendations <laughs> recommendations can make all the difference. Hey, I got to ask you. We're coming close to the end of our time together, but I got to ask you: it, it, is the you know, uh, you're you and I probably. Uh, politically are a little different, aligned a little differently. I'm a, I'm a card-carrying union member, as I think I joked with you about. <laughs> uh, the IBEW, former, uh, well, still of an electrical worker, and we joked about a show you have coming up. And, yeah. and I, I just want to ask you, is, you know, Friedman wrote in the 70s, he said the social responsibility is to increase um, profits, basically. Do, do you think that still rings true or, or do you think there's a, you know, as Paul Hawkins says, that there's, the, there's this an ecology of commerce, that there's this sense and, you know, even, I, I don't even like the phrase corporate social responsibility anymore, but there's, this, there's an ethic behind what businesses, try, we hope, that they're trying to do that ultimately can make a difference in the world. Businesses and, and our, our economy, our capitalistic economy is driven and based on making money and making profits. Yes. And despite what some people might say, 
And it's been splashed all over the papers now. You know, Mark Kearney was in the paper saying, oh, businesses are hoarding all kinds of cash. Um, and, and they may do that, but they're not hoarding it. They're not hanging on to it forever. Mm-hmm. Because there is, when, when a business has too much cash, that's not good. It's not good business. And, uh, and the CEOs will get kicked out very quickly because uh, if you're hoarding cash, you're not employing your assets Right. Uh, uh, properly. Right. So, for and 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 this has been a topic of discussion in in much of the press. That when did profits become a dirty word? Why right. is it, why right. is it bad? Right. It's right. It's not bad. It's what makes the world go round, or at least our little world in uh, in in the West. Um, uh, you know, we're not a communist country. We. Uh, 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 Everyone's not treated the same. We do have, we do have different tiers and different classes, and that will happen in a capitalistic um, mm-hmm. environment. Uh, so it's it's good. It's healthy when businesses make money because when they make money, they expand and they invest. Um, when individuals make money, they tend to save it. <laughs> right, right. And they'll put it in a savings account, in an RSP. Um, and uh, now, granted, those monies do get invested, but businesses by design will invest in, uh, in, in growth and expansion. Uh, so that's the main reason why I think, yeah, it's, it's good. So when I, see a, when I see a company making good profits, making big profits, um, I, I applaud them. Mm-hmm. You know, good for you. And unless they've got some kind of monopoly conspiracy going on, like I believe the uh, uh, the the, uh, um, the fuel companies have. <laughs> I'm I'm still I'm still uh, amazed and befuddled how how everyone puts the gas price up exactly two cents. At the very same time, right. yes, <laughs> I don't understand that yeah, part. I'm not, a, I'm not a conspiracist, but boy, there seems to be <laughs> something going on there. Yeah. But uh, you know, I'm just a simple caveman, so maybe I don't understand the uh, right. the economies I, of scale right, right, right. <laughs> for that particular business. Um, but so, yes, I, I so, do. Uh, you were you were going down the path of the show that I have coming up on the 25th of February, where I'm interviewing Buzz Hargrove, the former yes. uh, leader of the CAW. And uh, and our topic is have unions passed their best before date? Right. Uh, it's uh, it, when when unions were first brought in in the twenties and thirties, and their primary responsibility was uh, solidarity for better working conditions, safety. Uh, uh, people were working six and seven days a week. They were working to exhaustion. Yeah. They weren't making. Uh, very much money, and 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 that was wrong. Now we you know we fast forward a hundred years from uh, from those the early 1900s, and what is the role and responsibility of unions today? We you can't keep demanding more money from companies because they'll just put their prices up, which so we've got escalation of inflation. Um, so what is the role and responsibility? We've got, uh, we've got workplace safety insurance boards that will pay workers if they're injured on the job. We've got um, employment insurance. We've got Canada pensions. We've got individual pensions going on within the companies. Uh, we've got great benefits. Uh, we've got legislation coming out the yin yang mm-hmm. on on protectionism for for workers and uh, and exercising human rights and and our charter of rights and freedoms. We've got all of this protectionism from from the governments, which I will give the unions credit because of of their pushing. It it pushed the government into doing this, but how much more is is realistic, and what is what are the unions really doing now? Are they are they there to still protect the worker? Right. Are right. they there because they're running a business? 
What's their role? Yeah, well, what, you know, what's, you know, let's ask the same question. What's the social responsibility of a union, you know? We have, yeah. You know, Friedman asked the question and answered it back in the 70s. But, uh, yeah, no, I think it's a, it's a valid question. I think it has to be answered. And I, I'd like to think what they're, you know, the answer is going to be is we're providing a sense of community. You know, I mean, not just a fancy rotary club, but, I mean, I, I, I'd i like to think there's there's other value there as well. I mean, I, I still pay my non-working dues to the IBEW, and <laughs> and I still have my card, as, as they say, and I could go back to uh, doing electrical work uh, tomorrow if I needed to. But, you know, for me, it's cheap insurance um um but uh uh well i'll look forward to that show i uh it sounds like it's going to be a good one so when's that coming up on the 25th? Uh, that one's on uh february the the 25th right uh of uh 2013 this year have you and, heard, mm-hmm. sorry go ahead and and i was going to say it's uh it's on biz radio canada which uh broadcasts over blog talk radio excellent good um have you heard of julia molden I have not. She wrote a book called We Are the New Radicals. Mm-hmm. And uh, it might be somebody you want to look into at some point down the road as a p- possible guest. But her, her, her um, uh, kind of her thesis, she does a lot of interviews uh, with people who have gotten to a certain point in their lives, lawyers, uh, professionals of one kind or another, doctors and so on, business people who have gotten to a certain point in their life. They're, they're dissatisfied. And you know what? I, I really want to do something else. I want to do something more. And uh, they start their own uh, nonprofit. They start volunteering more hours, you know, just kind of giving back to society, this idea of the greater good. Um, I think it's wonderful, and it's a great book, and Julia is wonderful as well, and I think she's doing a really interesting service uh, for all of us, frankly, telling these stories. But do you align yourself with that? I mean, do you think, I mean, you sound pretty positive about business, and I like that, and I think that's great. And, I mean, do you think, I mean, do you see? I mean, that's the future for us, like a, a, a business with a with a social conscience. Is that is that where we should be heading? Well, I, my belief is that the only reason that businesses have developed a social conscience is because it's a great marketing platform. Right. Okay. It makes them look good in front of the customer. Right. Otherwise, they wouldn't be doing it. <laughs> right. 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 Their shareholders. Uh, would not stand for it, uh, but if it's good for business to uh, to save a whale, if it's uh, good for business to uh, to uh, support a uh, uh, a cause, to get behind uh, a, a disease, to uh, participate in many of the, uh, the, the to correct many of the social injustices that we that we do unfortunately have in our world today um, the the one and only reason why they do it is because it's good for business it raises their profile people love to do business with companies that they believe are mm-hmm. giving mm-hmm. back to a community no absolutely yeah. so if it if it didn't have an impact on the bottom line, if it didn't improve their brand, they wouldn't do it. So so can I can I take from that then that a business uh, doesn't have uh, like that? There's hmm, hard, a tough question. Uh, it almost seems to me that shareholders lack an ethical foundation of some kind, in the sense that uh, if it's if it's not good for us, we're not going to do it. So is isn't there like isn't there a reason for doing something because it's the right thing to do? Or well. Is, if- if you want to get really philosophical, David. Yeah. <laughs> and I just might, depending on the day. And I'm not even drinking, David. <laughs> That's another time. <laughs> if we examine Maslow's hierarchy of needs, <laughs> yes. why do any of us do good things in the world today? I mean, if, other than... Other than we've been raised to, uh, you know, to, to not hurt other people right, and right, not do bad right, things. Right. But why do people, when they when they have a big whack of money, um, why do they why do they give to uh, to charitable causes? Uh, even people that don't have a big whack of money, why do they give to uh, charitable causes? You know, because it makes them feel good. Right. Um, I I I was I was coaching. I was coaching this uh, company, this little company that was a flower shop, and I asked them the question, you know, why do, why do customers buy from you? And, you know, they gave me all the answers, oh, because we give great service, blah, 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 blah. And I said, so why does one person 
mm-hmm. give a ten dollar basket of flowers, and another person gives a hundred dollar basket of flowers, and uh, and they said, oh, it's because how much they care about the other individual. I said, no, it has nothing to do with how much they care about the individual. It has everything to do with about how much they care about themselves. Right. <laughs> because <laughs> because if. If they, if it was, if it were true that they only cared about the other individual, they wouldn't expect a thank you. <laughs> right, right. <laughs> and and if you and, and invariably people send a nice big basket of flowers or fruit, and if they don't get a thank you, they're on the phone saying, "Did you get the basket of flowers? Right, Did you right, get the?" Right. We do it because we want to feel good. So it, it's about self-interest then, from from your perspective, not only not only business but also social change. It's is driven. It's it's driven because we want to feel good about ourselves. Right. We want to feel we want to feel that we've we've done something, we've accomplished something. Uh, you know, it goes back to the, the the adage that we we can never love any more live any love anyone more than we can love ourselves. Right. So that's why you know we're taught you got to love yourself first, and then you can have the capacity to love other people. We need to feel good about ourselves, and when we help someone, we feel good about ourselves. Indeed. Hey, um, just to wrap up, uh, I think uh, Warren Buffett said that in the business world, quote, the rear view mirror is always clearer than the windshield, close quote. <laughs> it's such a wonderful quote. Um, a- any comments? <laughs> I, uh, I hope that Mr. Buffett lives another hundred years because the older he gets, uh, the wiser he gets, yes, and the better quotes he comes out. With. <laughs> That's so right. I hope he continues on. <laughs> yeah, me too. <laughs> I think that I think that's a brilliant quote. Um, well, listen, thanks for joining us. Uh, it's uh, it's been uh, it's been enlightening and a lot of fun. And again, you know, I I think I probably said this in the last uh, four or five interviews that I've done. I just I, we get to the end and I just feel like we barely scratched the surface. It's. Uh, <laughs> It's always so wonderful. So, um, uh, biztvcanada.com. That's B-I-Z-T-V Canada. I'll assume most Canadians know how to spell that. Dot com. Any any final words for us, David? Um, uh, the uh, the only well, final words yeah. are to those entrepreneurs that are out there. Uh, if you're struggling, don't worry about it. Uh, plow through. Um, we all feel low on. Uh, on different days. Uh, sometimes it feels like it's one step forward and three steps back. Stay focused. Uh, find a buddy that you can, uh, that you can talk to, that you can cry on their shoulder, that you can share your, your celebrations. And, uh, uh, but I would say that the, uh, if I can give anyone any piece of advice is uh, don't wait for those big successes to celebrate. Celebrate those little successes every single day, and you'll be just fine. Uh, that's great advice. Well, thanks for joining us, and uh, yeah, we'll, we'll, we'll look forward to uh, spending some more time together in the future. My pleasure, David, anytime. Thanks.